Then Lucille found the cause that needed all her skills and all her determination. It was the chance to live out her childhood dream to be a doctor in the third world. The job offer was irresistible, the savannah of East Africa. She would work in exchange for airfare and cigarettes. The invitation came from the handsome Italian. Piero Corti dreamed of opening a clinic. He needed a surgeon. I was looking for someone who was going really to join me in that kind of adventure. It happened to have the possibility of uh, asking Lucille to come and help me to do surgery for, four, for the first few months in Gulu, while she was in France. She said yes, and of course, I didn't think much about it, but the idea from the very beginning was that that's probably going to be my wife if she accepts. If you ask Piero, he will tell you that I, fall, I fell in love with Africa. And then in a way to stay in Africa, I decided to marry him. That is his interpretation, but it's not mine, you know. And, uh, but slowly, slowly, working together, you know, uh, it was not the... the uh, love at first sight. Love at first sight. Um, staying together, working together, and uh, we decided that we both enjoy the, the, the place, the, the work we were doing, and then we, we decided that we were also fit one for the other, so we decided to get married. They were married in the tiny chapel at St. Mary's Hospital. It was 1961, and for expatriates, Uganda was still a lush paradise, the pearl of Britain's African colonies. Every day was an adventure. They were a true team, he with the vision of what could be done in this place, she with the practical sense of getting it done. Lucille and Piero's hospital grew from 40 beds to 60, then 100, 200, 400. He raised money from family, friends, and churches. She operated and began an outpatient clinic. Gloria Gelieu came to visit in 1963. I do remember that uh, they were engrossed with their work, both of them. I remember uh, Dr. Corti Piero uh, presenting to us his uh, uh, ideas about a new hospital about a maternity ward, about a school for nurses at that time. It did not exist. It was only in their minds. But 25 years ago, with help from Canada, they started the first nursing school outside the capital. For many young Acholi women, this is still the only way out of the village. Then came the programs to train midwives and community health teams. They built a network of small clinics in the bush across northern Uganda. Hundreds of thousands of children felt the presence of Lucille and Piero's hospital. By 1962, Uganda becomes independent. There's great joy. At St. Mary's Hospital, more happiness, Lucille gives birth to a baby girl. Dominique is a blonde little African who keeps a pet gazelle. Margaret Conway, a missionary teacher from Newfoundland, remembers this period well. Just a year after I'm in, and the momentum was still there. You could get anything in Uganda, anything in Kampala. Economically, it was at the peak, and people called it the Pearl of Africa, remember? Uh, as in the anthem, and uh, really believed it was then, the Pearl of Africa. Beautiful place, lovely people, place that tourists flocked to in those days. Those were the wonderful days after independence. But paradise is coming apart. Uganda is being polarized, northerners versus southerners. By 1971, a military officer gets the message. Power flows from the barrel of a gun. He gives himself supreme authority, president for life, Idi Amin Dada. 
He's a butcher who eliminates his adversaries. He personally leads public executions. The reign of the man they call Big Daddy will cost 300,000 Ugandan lives. Lucille and Piero must make a painful decision. They feel Uganda has become too dangerous for a child. Dominique thinks of herself as a little acholi, but she's sent away to stay with relatives in Italy. Ah, this was terrible, I tell you. And when I came back during, uh, when I was resting at home and thinking about her so far away, I must tell you that I've been crying a lot. And my husband was a bit uh, shouting at me, saying, eh, what do you want to cry for? This is normal life. The children we made, they are made to go away. I said, yes, but before God, they don't go away <laughs> so early during the life. And the boy was saying like that just to try to cheer me up anyway. But it was really a terrible uh, situation for me, terrible, terrible. From now on, they will only see Dominique on holidays. 1979, Idi Amin invades Tanzania, which counterattacks. Desperate soldiers are everywhere. Margaret Conroy, too, is caught in the chaos. But it was a, a time of complete chaos, when the roads were extremely dangerous and uh, people were being killed for nothing. You know, robbers everywhere. Because it wasn't just the, the armies, it was also people taking advantage of the chaos, you know? So it was a time of, of uh, terrible chaos, and I think Gulu was right in the middle of the worst of it. The hospital is completely cut off. Wounded soldiers and civilians flood the place. Others come to plunder. Most of the staff have fled. By the light of a small generator, Lucille operates round the clock. When the worst is over, she writes home. Gulu is now a ghost city, deserted and devastated. We have been lucky enough. In the looting, our hospital only lost a lorry, three ambulances, a car, drug supplies, and surgical equipment. What next? What shall we do? For the moment, we have no choice. We are the only doctors in the room.